This is a very dirty and yellowed Commodore Amiga 500. I bought this computer listed as untested. It needs a clean and a retro bright for that extreme yellowing, particularly on one side of the A500 case. So first we need to give this system a clean using some baking soda and some elbow grease. And after a simple clean, it's looking a little bit better, but we do need to tear down the system to give it a thorough clean. So we remove the torque screws at the bottom and lift the top case we do, exposing the extremely dirty keyboard and dirty RF shield. We remove the keyboard connector and then we can easily remove the keyboard. This system really does need a clean. So we remove the RF shield, we do. We then remove the power and ID cable connecting to the floppy drive and remove its screws. Finally, removing it from the main board. So let's take a look at what powers the Amiga 500. First of all, I need to point out that this Amiga 500 board is the Revision 5 board. During the A500's life, there were lots of revisions made. For example, variations to the main chips and different kickstart ROMs included. This is a PAL region board and was made between the years 1989 and 1990. The Amiga 500 uses a Motorola 68000 CPU. This same CPU would also be used on the Amiga 500 Plus and 600 and other computers and home consoles, namely a few, the Atari ST, original Macintosh and Sega Mega Drive. The Amiga 500 has many custom chipsets. Let's talk about these briefly. These chips are all part of the OCS, known as the original chipset. Denise, Fat Agnes and Paula define the Amiga's graphics and sound capabilities. Fat Agnes is the heart of the OCS. It includes the Blitter Sub components for fast transfer of data. It handles all the direct access to the RAM, the CPU, and the other custom chips. Paula is the primary audio chip for the Amiga. It also handles the interrupts and the I.O. functions such as the floppy drive, serial ports, and joysticks. Denise is responsible for all graphical related tasks, for example displaying any sprites being used. Denise can use up to 6-bit plain data registers to get the display data that Agnes retrieves from the chip RAM. The Amiga 500 has 512 kilobytes of chip RAM. However, this can be expanded up to 1 megabytes by adding an additional 512 kilobytes of RAM using the A501 RAM expansion module or a third party expansion module by connecting it to the trap door slot as shown here. Gary, short for the gate array, provides the glue logic for the bus control and houses supporting functions for the floppy disk drive. And finally, the Amiga has two identical CIA chips named odd and even. These chips are designed for peripheral interfacing and system timers. Each chip is assigned to perform a different task. For example, even is assigned to the floppy control and serial control, while odds functions are assigned to the parallel port, the keyboard, joystick, and mouse. With the main board now detached from the bottom RF shield, it is now time to give the Amiga shell a well-deserved wash, removing all the dirt and grime 
built up over the years. And while we leave them to dry, I've taken the time to remove all the keys from the keyboard. Cleaning each key with soapy water and removing all the grime from the base of the keyboard. With the keyboard looking a lot better, we now turn our attention to the keys, which have a lot of yellow beans still on them. To regular bright the keys, I fill a small container with hydrogen peroxide with UV lights shining around the container with tin foil to keep the heat inside, allowing the process to work. I next turn my tank into the Amiga shell. I instead use cream peroxide with cling film as I don't have a large enough container to fit the shells flat down. However, this process should work. I cover the film with cream and place each shell and wrap it. I will check on the shells every few hours and continue to massage the cream in with the shell. We now turn our attention to the capacitors on the main board. These capacitors are over 30 years old. While they show no sign of leakage, it's always recommended to replace them every 20 years. I'll be replacing these capacitors with a known good brand and replace each one with the correct value. Several hours later, each capacitor is removed and all the new ones are in its place. Fourteen hours later, I remove the keys from the peroxide and wash them. All the yellowing is gone. So, it's now time to put grease on each key and place them back on the clean keyboard. With every key installed, it is looking fantastic. 72 hours later, let's click up on those shells. Time to rewash the shells and dry them. And here is the final result. While not perfect, it is a hundred times better than it was before. Because of the use of UV lights, the process takes much longer. So I'm hoping in the summer to do the process again, but using the sun instead. The Amiga 500 has a floppy drive. It is the main way of accessing workbench and playing games. However, this drive doesn't seem to be working. The drive is making a clunking noise, which is possibly the motor needing a clean and some new grease. I take apart the drive, clean the laser with IPA, and apply fresh grease to all moving parts. However, the issue still persisted after cleaning the floppy disk drive. I decided to look at the GoTex drive, a USB emulator for the Amiga which sits in place of the original floppy drive. However, the issue still occurred on the emulator too. I spent hours troubleshooting and trying to find a solution. For example, swapping the two CIA clips and seeing if that fixes it. However, even that solution did not fix it. We will be ending the video here, but hopefully part two will be out very, very soon to give you an update on the current issue. I hope you've enjoyed the video and until next time, bye for now.